I'd like you to imagine that these are your feet. You can feel the warmth of the sun on your face and a light breeze across your body. The cold water washes over your toes, sending a wee shiver throughout yourself. You wiggle your toes in the water and the sand, feeling the different textures in the environment. You can feel everything, and you feel alive. Now, I'd like you to imagine the exact same situation. Only as you stand there, you start to feel the sand covering your toes. As you look down, you realize you are slowly starting to sink. On the inside, you are panicking, struggling. And yet you are frozen still. You want to scream, but your voice makes no sound. The desire to escape starts to fade as you give up on hope. You continue to slowly sink into the depths alone. This is my analogy for living with mental ill health. Today, I'm going to talk to you from my experiences, experiences of living with depression, and try my best to explain to you why I do what I do. My experience with depression has meant doing a lot of things which I knew would create risk and jeopardize positive aspects in my life, relationships, career paths, and opportunities. As good things in life build up, and I start to achieve goals, I begin to sabotage myself, self-destruct, and ultimately hurt myself and those close to me. Why? Simply because deep down, I believe I don't deserve any of it. I'm wired to feel that I am worthless. Sufferers are often highly functional. In fact, in many cases, they are social people. We are desperate not to be alone, even though this doesn't stop the feeling of loneliness. If you have depression, you can be in a room full of people and still feel absolutely alone and isolated. If you look at the number of comedians who have come out as struggling, you can see the trait. The joker who wants everyone else in the room to be happy whilst internally is struggling. Where I believe society primarily misunderstands is that it believes having a mental health problem makes you weak or incapable. I think this is especially true in the business and MBA environment. I grew up pretty happy. Depression started to impact me when I hit 17. I have no trigger which I can identify. I just started to slide from being mentally healthy to not. Perhaps, though, this is part of the problem. How do you identify the baseline? Was I ever really mentally healthy? I think a lot of people believe having depression means that you wish to die. This isn't the case at least for me and many people I've spoken to. The reality is, you no longer wish to exist. Death is still terrifying, but with no hope to move forward with, you start to run out of alternative ideas. These feelings build, and ultimately, you find no escape. I often wake up feeling ashamed and struggle to look myself in the mirror with self-respect. I see a pathetic person who deserves none of the fantastic opportunities I've been given. This then starts a cycle into self-hate. So what is self-hate? I like to think of this as a complementary, two-sided situation. I still live with self-hate, but it doesn't mean I really hate myself. It means I create hate for myself. Hate which I have to manage on a regular basis. Sometimes it's as simple as waking up, looking in the mirror, and a bit like the scene from Mean Girls, listing all the things I dislike about how I look. Picking apart my physical appearance, personality, how I performed in sport or school or work, this is the first side, the basic hate. The complementary side to this is the destructive hate. 
I can wake up feeling good, look in the mirror, maybe pull a Johnny Bravo pose, and leave my home thinking, you know what, I'm okay. Then inevitably, I will do something to create hate within myself. It might be how I speak to someone who doesn't deserve it. It could be hurting someone's feelings. Or most likely, if everything's gone okay for a while, drinking enough alcohol to induce a horrific hangover, so at the very least, I will physically feel bad and probably have a few drunken regrets. After accepting my problem, I had to get over my prejudices with how to deal with it. Nowadays, I live with daily medication. I believe this helps to control my emotional peaks and troughs. Sadly, it doesn't remove any of my problems. It just makes them more manageable, most of the time. Even though I'm up here talking to you today, I still struggle to live with myself. So far in 2019, I can say it's been more of a struggle than a joy. Perhaps the easiest explanation for the emotions of someone with a mental health problem is that they're exactly the same as a regular person's, but their peaks and troughs are greater. Perhaps they have a higher or lower frequency, depending on what mental health issue they are facing. The cyclic nature of mental health is often true for most people who suffer from issues similar to depression, such as stress or anxiety. Without medication, I regress emotionally. Someone terrified to seek help out of fear of looking weak and full of shame, afraid of admitting who they really are. So who am I when the floodgates open? In my mid-twenties, I was working as an engineer in oil and gas, and howding, that, hiding, <laughs> I really was on the inside. I'd wake up in the morning and I would head to the gym. On the way, I would cry. After the gym, I would jump in my car and head to work. Again on the way, I would cry. After work, it was time to go to rugby training. Again on the way, I would cry. Eventually, I'd get home and the crying would stop. But then, the lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, wondering who I really am and what I'm really worth would begin. The interesting part of this, though, isn't the repetition of crying, but the fact that I still can't explain why it happened. And this is one aspect of mental health I would like to express, especially with issues such as depression and anxiety. The person won't choose for it to happen. Choices haven't led them to it. It just is. It is a state which they're almost definitely struggling to understand and cope with. Like any other impact on human health, such paralysis or being born deaf. No one brings it upon himself, but one hopefully learns to manage it. Unlike, mel that, unlike many illnesses or disabilities, I don't believe we talk about it or accept mental ill health as readily in society. So how do we, the mental health impaired people, cope? Usually through self-harm in one form or another. For me personally, Self-harm has always been based around being as busy as possible, so I literally do not have time to deal with my problems. Pushing myself physically as hard as I can, drinking beyond healthy limits, always saying yes to any opportunity or threat, mentally torturing myself over my regrets, and if all this fails, physically cutting myself. The interesting thing here, though, is that the most peaceful item on this list is the physical self-harm. It's a form of relief. I am in control. I can do it lightly to achieve a chemical reaction or punish myself by going harder. I stand here today as a 33-year-old and can state that I'm still not over physical self-harm. Sometimes I'll be at the bottom of a trough and I find cutting myself the best way out. It's a very personal thing, though. It's never for attention, and it's never to make a statement. It's about taking back control and starting again. At my worst, it was daily. At my best, it could be over a year in between. As of today, I haven't done it since last week. 
This clearly isn't a healthy coping mechanism, but finding one can be very difficult, especially when another typical behavior is isolation. At my lowest, I chose who I would leave letters for, how I would end my life, and where. My hometown, on my home hill, at dawn. I chose which whiskey I would drink and which drugs I would combine it with to ensure that I would never wake up again. Through my 20s, I planned this in more and more detail. By the time I was in my mid-twenties, I had accepted I would end my life after my parents passed away. Why then? Because I feel my parents had been through enough already. So by waiting until then, all I had or have to do is live with myself. How hard can that be? Thankfully for me, my parents are still going strong. Although I have shared and have a better understanding of myself, I still struggle. One of my biggest fears is that I'll end up alone. Not because I think I'm unlovable, and not because I will not ever manage to love myself, but because I truly struggle to see a future where I even manage to like myself. And without this, how can you truly be part of a successful relationship? And so why are these experiences and thoughts relevant to you today? I'm hoping that by sharing, any of you who are struggling to seek the help you need will do so. Also, I'm hoping that for those of you who had no idea about how mental health issues function in the mind, you might leave today with a bit of a better appreciation. And why is this important? Because I know I'm not alone. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development released a report stating that mental ill health overall costs the UK more than 94 billion pounds a year. And this is almost certainly not just down to me. 70 million workdays are lost in the UK each year due to mental health problems. Think how many workdays could be saved if we could understand the situations on a deeper level. But in the time I've spoken today, about 15 people have committed suicide, and 300 have attempted to. 15 lives are now gone from this world. Perhaps one of them held the cure to cancer or global warming or was going to be the greatest primary school teacher the world had ever seen. Each of these lives had potential, no matter what age or background, gender, ability or disability, race or sexuality, and it is now gone. If we can understand others on a deeper level, we can work together so that people aren't lost from the world. I have a friend at London Business School. I know, I made a friend. They share a lot of my challenges, and yet for a different disorder. This person is an outgoing, highly, annoyingly highly, attractive individual with a fantastic future ahead of them. A vastly cooler person than I could ever be. And yet they're medicated daily for anxiety, in secret. It started for my friend as a 10-year-old. Instead of participating in sports, they would hide at home alone. They no longer wanted to play or see friends. Then school started to be missed. Eventually, it escalated to the point where their parents had to take time off work, impacting the whole family. Rather than having fun and growing, they spent three years afraid and lost. But perhaps the saddest part of this story is that I am the only person at London Business School who they have shared this with. It is rubbish that in our society today, they are so ashamed of something which they can't help that they instead choose to hide it for fear of judgment. My hope is that with understanding, we can work together to show that mental health is not weakness. It is just a state, but a state that can be managed. It doesn't need a cure. It needs societal acceptance and understanding. 
If you are struggling, please do seek help, as I promise you one thing from my own and other people's experiences. Sharing your problem will not result in you being weak, and you should not be ashamed. I understand how difficult it can be to ask for help. For me, this was because I was completely and utterly ashamed of my feelings. I went the best part of 15 years never sharing with anyone what was really going on inside my mind. If I can give you one piece of advice, it is take a chance and tell someone close to you. The first time I ever opened up, I was sat in a coffee shop with a friend from work. She patiently sat with me for around an hour and a half as I cried, sniffed, and struggled to put into words what I had kept secret for almost 15 years. From the outside, I imagine it looked an awful lot like a terrible breakup scene from a terrible romantic comedy. But it truly was the start of me taking ownership of who I really am. And the energy used to do it was significantly less than the energy I wasted in fear keeping it a secret. For anyone listening who might be worried about someone, then my advice to you is to remain patient. Do your best to listen whilst avoiding becoming a crutch. Ultimately, if you let someone lean on you too much, you too will feel the burden, especially if they're my size. In terms of helping them to open up, my advice is always ask people how they feel and not to accept an answer until it is an actual feeling. Okay is not a feeling. Now the warning. You will need help and you need to share but please be careful not to use people as a crutch to avoid working through your own problems. I have done this, and in the process, I've irreparably hurt more people than I can count. Even once I had shared, I had to learn this lesson again, and I continue to do so. As painful as it was for me, it's nothing compared to the hurt I've caused others, especially to a few individuals. One example of many is in my past relationships. I would convince myself that so long as I had my girlfriend, I would be fine. This would lead to jealousy, toxic, unacceptable comments, and immaturity as I struggled to deal with my own emotions. I would project this onto them as though they were somewhere responsible for my problems and my wellness. I would lean on them until a breaking point, and I live with that each day. You don't forget, and being sorry will not fix it. Mental health problems hide inside of you. Physical appearances will not reveal them. They will ebb and flow, peak and trough. This has to be accepted and then expected. No matter how much self-harm creates calm for you, it will not resolve any of your problems. Self-hate will wear you down and create more chaos in your mind. The only way I have started to manage my depression and accept it was to share. Please, if you are struggling, do the same. Do not struggle alone in the sand, sinking into the depths. Be brave. Reach out to someone and share with them what is really going on. Thank you.